In the Pippet household, uh, Liz and I have a goal, and that goal is for well-behaved children. Uh, but that doesn't just happen because we want it to. We don't have to just wish it and suddenly our kids are like, yes, mum, how can I help? Uh, Sam isn't just uh, automatically doing the dishes and saying, yes, I will fill it as well. Not a problem, mum. I have no problems putting chicken bones in the, uh, the rubbish bin. That is fine. See, kids don't just come out of the womb and suddenly they're well behaved. No, often there's processes and systems and methods that we as parents need to put in place that make it more likely that our kids are going to be well behaved. And yes, that is a photo of my kids. Uh, and so we as parents have systems. Um, so we have, I, I talked a little bit about this last week. Uh, if, they, uh, if someone has been rude to us or not doing what we've asked them to or have told them to wash their hands and they haven't, uh, then what we do is we say, okay, well, you're in the, you go to time out and you spend a little bit there. If they're still not listening to us or, or being rude, then bam, they lose tech time, which is like the, the <laughs> it's, it's life in our, in our family. Uh, it's really important. Don't make me lose the iPad. Uh, <laughs> I need more Minecraft. There's redstone that must be mined. Um, so if, then they lose tech. And then if they are still rude, then on top of that, they will lose screen time. And so, yes, we will watch uh, High School Musical, the musical, the series, and they won't be able to watch it with us. I know this is bad. And Bluey, no Bluey for you. So, uh, there is, if our kids misbehave, there is consequence. But at the same time, if they are good, there's also good things they get. They get a sticker, uh, they, and enough stickers, they get a prize box, get Lego minifigs and cards, games, and, and the like. And, and so we have these systems in place uh, for them. And then on top of that, we as parents need to make sure that they're getting enough sleep, that they're at, you know, in bed at the right time and, and that they get drinking water and that they've got food because if the kids don't have food then they start to get a little bit narky um, and we make sure that we have hours of power, they help out of the house. We have all these structures, all this organisation that is there in place in order to achieve the goal of well-behaved kids. Okay, So the goal, that organisation is there in order to achieve the goal. And I say that because here, Israel has a goal. Remember, this comes right after chapters 8 to 10. Chapters 8 to 10 of Nehemiah is all about Israel going, we don't have a great relationship with God, we want a good relationship with God. So chapters 8, they're reading, they're reading the Bible. Chapters 9, uh, they're um, confessing, confessing who, they, who God is and who they are to God. And then chapter 10, it was all about obedience. They make a firm agreement agreement of uh, covenant renewal. And then here in chapters 11 and 12, what Nehemiah does is he provides the organization and the infrastructure to allow the spiritual renewal to continue. See, part of the obedience in chapter 10 was obedience to the law. And not just a bit of the law, it was the whole law. As a result, they needed, that means the ritual law. Uh, as a result, they needed Jerusalem to be back in the system of what it was previously. They need a working temple. They need Levites. They need priests. They need musicians. They need an infrastructure to allow the spiritual renewal to continue. Um, and then after that, they have a massive party. And we see this in chapter 12, the dedication of the wall. There is a celebration and a procession. And they sing out joyfully to the Lord for what he has done. All right, so they're the two main things that we're going to, right? Organization, allowing for spiritual growth, as well as joyous celebration. All right, so uh, the wall was finished. Nehemiah, the wall finished in chapter 615, but we didn't get a dedication or celebration at that time, right? So you got 615, you got the wall finished, and then here in chapter 11 and 12, you get the dedication of the wall. Now, the reason why they didn't celebrate straight away is because they knew that the war was not a means, that the war, war wasn't an end to itself. It was the mean to the end. The war was great, but the war was only part of the process of getting back into a good relationship with God. Okay? So the war isn't the yay. What is yay is what the war helped them to achieve through um, a, a restored relationship of Israel and Yahweh. And that's why the dedication happens after. And so it starts, verse 1 to 2. Now the leaders of the people settled in Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of every ten of them to live in Jerusalem, the holy city. 
while the remaining nine were to stay in their own towns. The people commended all who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. So, for the ritual law to be uh, established and to continue, they need people to live in Jerusalem. We saw in chapter 7, Jerusalem was sparsely populated. No one was living there because to do so would be mean to live in rubble. No one really liked that idea, so they lived in villages outside of the city. But now that the wall is restored, it's time for people to move back in. But a lot of people were like, nah, we don't really want to do that, uh, because we have our land, our ancestral land, we have our mates, we have our friends. It's like if you've lived in a certain area in Sydney your whole life, you don't really want to move out of that area of Sydney, because, you know, you've got your grassroots, you've got your roots down, you know everything. You don't want to have to try and find another doctor, another hairdresser, another really good Coles. No, no, you're happy with where you're at. And so that was a little bit like this with Israel. And so what Nehemiah did, is he didn't just go, yep, you go, you go, you go. No, he said, all right, we're going to cast lots. And in casting lots, the idea was uh, God chooses who will go and live in Jerusalem. It wasn't up to Nehemiah. Through the use of casting lots, it was up to God. And we saw uh, that casting lots is also used for the disciples when they're trying to figure out who should be uh, the, net, the replacement disciple for Judas. And so we see that again. However, um, just because they cast lots doesn't mean that we as Christians should. I don't think we should use this as a, a biblical example of what God wants me to gamble because it's in the Bible. They cast lots, I'm going to cast lots, let's go to Star Casino. No. <laughs> what, what you'll find there is what God wants for you is to be very, very poor. Uh, that would be a bad application of this passage. But this is what was used at that time in the Old Testament specifically for God to decide who would live in Jerusalem. All right, and then you have a whole heap of lists. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them because it will help you to understand this 11 and, chapters 11 and 12 if you can see what is going on with the list. All right, so first, in chapters 11, verse 3 to 24, he gives a list of the families that settled in Jerusalem. So this is kind of like a roll call of um, who is there, like Beulah, Beulah, Beulah. It's kind of what he's doing here in this passage, verse 3 to 24. And the people listed are kind of put in five different categories. Uh, Verse 4 to 6, if we go to the next, yep, uh, is the children of Judah. Uh, Verse 7 to 9 is the sons of Benjamin. Uh, Verse 10 to 14 are the priests. Verse 15 to 18 the Levites. Verse 19 to 24 the other. Now one thing to note here is that only two tribes are mentioned. Because remember, that's the only two tribes that are left in the old, in, at this time after the exile. Uh, because the northern tribes of Israel, they got uh, taken over by Assyria and they kind of got destroyed and assimilated into different countries. So the only two tribes left of Israel are now Judah and Benjamin mentioned here. Then verse 25 to 36, uh, these verses list the various towns where the rest of Judah and Benjamin tribes had settled. So their ancestral property, the property that Joshua had decided that their forefathers would live in, and that's where they live. All right? So Jews are either living in the villages of their ancestral uh, location, or they're living in Jerusalem. And as a part of living in Jerusalem, they are part of the ritual law, uh, keeping the temple worship going, but also providing men and women for the defense of the city in case of an attack. Then, in chapter 12, verse 1 to 26, we get another whole heap of names uh, that Mark is very grateful. I didn't make him read out. Um, A whole heap of the priests. Now, this list is different. This list is not a roll call of who's living in Jerusalem like the first one. This list is kind of like, here are the priests from Zerubbabel uh, down to the present time. Now, remember, Zerubbabel was the first guy who came from Babylon when they were in exile, and he came back to Judah. There were three groups, right? Zerubbabel, Ezra, Nehemiah. Yes? Okay. So now, Nehemiah is going, okay, here are the priests from Zerubbabel, the high priest and and, and the priests, and then this is how the line progressed to right now. Now, it looks like a whole heap of random names, but it is helpful in the context of someone could go, oi, that guy shouldn't be a priest. How, how dare Jimmy Bob over there be a priest? That doesn't work. Well, the Israelites can go, no, hang on a second. Let's go back to the list of Nehemiah. See, his dad, his dad was dad, was dad, was dad, was dad, came as a priest from Zerubbabel. He's a legitimate priest. So that is the reason why you have this big, long list. It's all to confirm the legitimacy of the ritual worship 
which was now going to take place. It's all a part of the organizing process of making sure that Israel is going to do what they said they were going to do. Okay? So then what do we do with that? We have a whole heap of people living in Jerusalem, we have casting lots, we have a list of priests. What is the application or relevance then for our life? There is this tension in churches between the need for spiritual freedom and the need uh, to do what the Spirit wants us to do, even if that is new and hasn't been done before, and a need for order, a need for processes, a need for method. Uh, church plants love, uh, get really excited about the freedom that being a church plant gives them, right? They don't have anything they have to necessarily do. They don't have any uh, law or tradition. It's all new. It's all fresh. They can do what they want, and it's all really exciting. But the problem comes with, in a church plant, there's always a time where they need processes. They need policies. They need paperwork. They need safe churches. They need structures in place in order to develop into spiritual maturation, into grow as a spiritual body. Uh, a guy I met uh, in my accreditation day, he's a pastor of a church. It was a church plant, but that was like seven years ago, and now it is developing, and now it is growing. And part of this means that he needs structures. He didn't have a leadership team. He, just until recently, he didn't have an eldership or a diaconate because it was a church plant. They didn't need one. But now he's going, well, we're getting to the point we need one. We need a group of people, so I'm not just making the decisions by myself. Uh, and as a result, the organization was needed, and he put that in. The idea is a vine needs a trellis. Yeah, The trellis is the, is the wood bits that the vine grows up into and is able to flourish as a result. Was well, the same thing for church. But then that puts us in a difficult tension where we need to find the balance between being open to what the Spirit is doing, to be open to have new wineskins for new wine, and to get rid of the old wineskins in certain situations. But at the same time, we need order, and we need structures, and we need methods in order to be as effective as we can for reaching the community for God. We need a balance between these two things, yeah? If we OD on tradition, then we get old, then we get uh, uh, stale, and then it's very hard for new people to come in because they're coming into an old thing. And we lose relevance with the community as a result. But if we OD the other way, then the problem is we're, we it's shambolic. There's no processes. We're, we're possibly not doing our duty of care and, and that people don't know what is going on. So as a church, we need to find a middle ground and balance the tension. Okay, so that's what I believe comes out of the first part in relation to the organization required for spiritual renewal. But then in the second half of chapter 12, we get this really cool official dedication of the wall. Uh, and they have a parade, they have a procession. This, these pictures are from the uh, Macy's Thanksgiving parade that happens in New York City. It happens every year, and gosh, the Americans are good at this. Um, <laughs> they're not good at a whole heap of other things, but they're really good at a float. Now, so what they do is they have balloons floating in the air between buildings like the Grinch and Olaf, and they have these massive floats, and it's, uh, the people come out, and they're like, yeah, isn't America great? Um, and, and it's a procession of thanksgiving of how they got to where they are as a country. As Australia, we don't really do parades. Like, we used to, right back in the, like the, in the day, in the 60s and stuff, before I was born, that there used to be big parades. My mum, uh, she was Miss Banana of Terranora uh, one year, and they had a float and a, and a parade down the, the main street of Terranora, and that was a parade. But we don't do that as much anymore, and mum will hate that I mentioned that. Uh, See, we, we do a really good, we do half decent protests, we do a really good Anzac Day march, but parades, not so much. And yet, that's kind of what we see here. Israel has a parade. They have a procession. The wall was technically finished in chapter 6, but there was no dedication of the wall at that time, as I talked about. There was no champagne bottle broken on the wall like they do with the ship. It's none of that. And now, though, here is the dedication. Now, here's the celebration. Now, is let's step back and go, how good is God that he got this wall built? See, this wall should not have been built. They didn't have the resources. There were people against them. They were mocking, and then they were going to go to war with them, and then they were going to fight them, and all these things. And yet still, God blessed them and was able to build a four-kilometer wall in 
50, in just over 50 days. And now is the time to celebrate that. Now is the time to go, how good is God because of what he has done in and through us? And, they, and before they get to the celebration, the procession, though, they need to prepare for it. Uh, we see this in the purification. Uh, verse 30. Uh, when the priests and Levites have purified themselves ceremonially, they purify the people, the gates, and the wall. And before that, uh, the Levites are gathered. They are assembled from all the surrounding nations. The Levites come. It's kind of like in Power Rangers where the watch goes off and it's like ding, 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 ding. Suddenly I have to go to uh, the base and become a mighty morphin Power Ranger. It's a similar thing for the Levites. The Levites, their little alarm went off, ding, 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 ding. Levites assemble and they go to Jerusalem and they go there because they need to do the, pro uh, the celebration which the war has allowed to happen. Before they do that, though, they need to do the purification. Now, I always found this weird. Uh, they purify the people. Gotcha. That's understandable. But they also purify the gates and the wall. And it's like, what does that look like? Like, what's an ancient Near East version of a gurney? Like, is that what they had to do to put, purify the wall? Uh, it's more likely they sprinkled it with sacrificial uh, blood, uh, and that was part of it. But the goal was that what was about to happen in the procession was a big deal. It was huge. And so they need to prepare for that big deal. Uh, when I go to a wedding, I take extra care to trim my beard, uh, to shave, to maybe, maybe even put on some aftershave. I know, that's a novel thought. Uh, I, I get my best suit from the recesses of my cupboard. I wipe off the cobwebs. Uh, I get that new shirt that I got cheap and never had a reason to wear, and I put that on, I try on the ties, what tie goes with this shirt and this suit, and then I choose one and then I ask my wife, and then I choose a different one. Um, I, 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 I try and look as schmick as I can. There's a lot of preparation that needs to happen uh, for a wedding. And that's just me as a guy. As a, as a female, that's a whole other kid in caboodle. Like, there's a whole heap of makeup I ain't putting on. Um, so there is a preparation for a big event. And in the same way, there is preparation here by the Levites for the big event. And it kind of raises the question, do we prepare to come to church? Do we prepare our hearts to worship? In some denominations and some churches, they meet early and they have five minutes of people just sitting there with soft music playing and they prepare their hearts to what God is going to teach them. Or they pray for the church in some way. Now, as a pastor, I prepare because uh, I pray for the church, I pray for the service, I pray for the sermon, uh, and I prepare what I'm going to say. Steve prepares what he's going to say as a leader. The, the music team prepares, but do we prepare our hearts for what God may have to do within us through this meeting, I think sometimes we don't. And I think as a result, we minimize what kind of thing we've got here itself. If this is a big thing for us, then maybe we do need to take time to prepare. All right, then is the procession. Uh, there are two groups, um, and, and there are basically two groups, and they go up, Did, can we go to the map? Sorry, Neil. Okay, so the two groups, they meet at uh, the Valley Gate, one goes clockwise to the temple, the other goes anti-clockwise, but also meets up at the temple. Now, what they're doing is they're actually walking on the wall. The wall was wide enough so that you could walk on it, and a lot of people did. If you go to Jerusalem uh, today, you can walk on the wall. It's a different wall, but it's the same idea. All right? And so there are two groups of people, each going different ways, meeting up at the temple. Uh, each of these groups contained a large Thanksgiving choir, a significant lay leader, uh, so Hoshia and Nehemiah, other leaders, and then priests with trumpets. This was a big group walking around the wall, and the people down the bottom were just walking around with them and going, yeah, how good is this? How great is God? What an amazing thing. Then verse 40, the two choirs that gave thanks then took their place in the house of God, so did I, together with half the officials. So that's the celebration process and the parade Look at the wall, look at how awesome it is, look what God has done, praise be to him. And then, in doing so, they made a lot of noise. Uh, verse 43, and on that day they offered great sacrifices, rejoicing because God had given them great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, the sound of rejoicing in Jerusalem could be heard from far away. All the people rejoiced with joy because of what God had done. And what's more than that is they rejoiced so hard that people from far away could hear them rejoicing. 
It's like when a bloke gets a new car. Uh, often, uh, especially an Aussie bloke, they would love to show off their car. Uh, they might fang it down the street or will rev the engine loudly as kind of a proclamation of, Oi, look how fully sick my new, new car is, bro. Um, that's kind of like, yeah, I'm excited about this. I want other people to know how awesome this new car is. But what Israel is doing is very similar. They're saying, look, bro, at how fully sick my wall is. <laughs> you know, God has allowed this to happen and we are going to be excited about it. We are going to tell everyone about it. And the neighbours, when the guy gets a fully sick car, the neighbours get it, right? The neighbours go, okay, he got a new vehicle, we're going to hear you revving for a little bit, but it's not going to last forever. It's not going to be continual. It's celebration because of that, right that moment. Um, and this noise kind of reminds us of Ezra 3.13. Uh, when the combination of weeping and rejoicing was heard far off, but now the time for weeping had passed, and we just get joy. Hardcore joy. Hardcore praise. Um, this is an elaborate service. This is an elaborate procession. This is an elaborate worship because of God, of what he did. That God is worth that worship. And I kind of like another part of the passage says that everyone is involved. Um, just like everyone was involved for the covenant agreement in chapter 10, where everyone goes, yes, we're going to obey the law. You get everyone involved in the celebration. The women, uh, the children who could understand, everyone is involved. And so again, we get to the part, well, what do we do with that? Uh, Israel has a big dedication process, and they're really, really stoked, and they're rejoicing hard. But then how does that relate to us? Well, worshipping in our church service is not Steve worshipping. At least that's not how it should be. It's not Ari worshipping. It's not um, Jesse and, and Nate and uh, Anthony. Anthony? Oh, sorry, man. <laughs> um, uh, it's not about those guys worshipping. What they're doing is they are allowing, providing the infrastructure for you to worship. It's about you worshipping. True worship occurs when you are communicating with God. When you are offering your praise, your worship, your very lives to Him. See, church is not a show, right? Um, I don't wear a suit uh, to preach. I don't wear a suit because you don't wear a suit. I I'm not wearing, I don't get dressed up. I don't have costumes so that I can entertain you. I am not an actor here performing for your benefit. No, 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 no. The, the performance isn't so much me to you. It is you to God. When you worship, you are acting not to me, not to the people around you. You are worshipping to God. The people up front are just providing the infrastructure to allow that to happen, but the goal is that you are worshipping Him. We, up the front, we're traffic control. Yeah? We're prompters. That's all that we're up to do, but we are not the be-all and end-all, and neither should we get the spotlight. That is not the goal. The goal is that you have your spotlight and you shine it up to God, not to us. The worship you do on a Sunday, Sunday morning, I can't make you do it. Steve, the band, they can't make you do it. You have to do it. True worship requires participation. Not mere presence, not mere observation. It's really easy to passively disengage with the church, fall into observation mode. You turn up, uh, you mouth the words to the song, but the shopping list is in your head while you do so. You're thinking about where you're going to go for lunch uh, during the sermon. Uh, you, you'll go for coffee because we have a, a pod machine, and it's all right, better than the Nescafe stuff. But, but then when you're talking with people, it's surface level. Oh, how was your day? Good. How was the weather? Oh, cold. But you don't actually be real or vulnerable with each other. You don't actually ask anyone to hold you accountable to anything like we talked about last week. It's very easy to be a passive observer in church. We can't make you participate. But to be a passive observer means you are not getting the best out of our worship. You are not getting the best out of Compton Park Baptist. You are not getting the best out of any church that God leads you to. Worship requires participation. Church service requires your participation, your engagement, your singing, your worship. That we don't fall into observation mode, but that we participate. Israel. In this dedication, they participated. They shouted, they prayed so loud that, that people from far away could hear them and go, what is going on over there? 
Well, the goal is that we would do similar. Often, in, just to take worship as an example, often when we do worship, um, we do worship. Like, uh, praise be to God. How good is God? Yeah, God is great. But we don't worship, you know? I was at a, at a men's camp. It was the best thing. It just really opened my eyes to what worship could be. I was at this men's camp, and we sang, um, And Can It Be? And you know that verse, My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth, and followed thee? Yep. The men just boomed it. Like it was, a, like, it was a, like it was a competition to see how loud you could go. There was no melody, uh, but these, these words were just going for it, right? Because these guys just wanted to praise God and do so. There was this realisation of what God had done for them, and they're just like, going, yes, how good is God? Well, if we are truly like that, then we will be doing that in our worship too. Too often we just go, uh, and can it be, my chains fell off, my heart was free. No! Uh, Let's get into it. No, no, Michael, you don't understand. I have a voice like a chainsaw. This is not a good... No, I don't care. I think it's the best when people who don't have a melodious voice are still willing to praise God because they're not praising God for me. They're praising God for God. And it is a symphony in his voice, in his ears. May we, when we pray, may we pray loudly. And not as a show, not to say, how awesome is he, my voice. No, it's not about that. It's about how awesome is my God. Yes? For when we worship, we want to do it participatory. We want to do it engaged. We want to do it as praise to our God. This is not a show. This, you, there, you're performing to Him. We're not performing to you. All right. And then there's a final part of this passage uh, that kind of ends up in chapter 12. Uh, verse 44. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits, and tithes. From the fields around the town, they were to bring into the storage the portions required by the law, the priests, and the Levites. But Judah was pleased with ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service for their God and the service of purification, as did also the musicians and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. What this is to say is the celebration is over. The spiritual high of the loud praise is done, and now the the rubber hits the road of daily living. Um, in youth ministry, uh, we often go on camps, um, and we, whether it's youth camps or black stump, and you have this amazing experience on camps. Uh, like four days of hanging out with your friends, and you're having fun, and you're abseiling, and you're canoeing, and you're water slide, and, and you're getting fed good food, and you don't have to do the dishes afterwards, and you play pranks, and, and you get good teaching, and great music, and you're like, boom! I'm going to recommit to God, and I'm going to go hard for Him because God has challenged me. How about He's got yeah? And then you get home, and then in 20 minutes' time, you're yelling at your mum, and you've had a fight with your brother, and, and why do I have to do the dishes now? And I'm so tired, and and like it fades, you know. You get this ah, and then you go, but the reality is, the normalcy of life is where the spiritual highs meet the reality. The goal is that what we have experienced in the highs continues and transforms our life in the normalcy of the everyday living, in the, in the, in the everyday just normal life with the errands and, and the food shopping and the chauffeuring kids from appointment to appointment and the work and the setting alarms off to go to work and the not staying up too late playing 500 to the early more hours of the morning because you know that you have an alarm that you have, will wake you up because you have to go to work. And that's kind of what we see here in Judah. They've had the spiritual high, but now they were going to continue in the spiritual life, in their day-to-day -day existence of honouring and worshipping God, even after that high. Any spiritual high we have as a Christian, the goal is that it then transforms our daily life. That we are able to continue to live for Him in the normalcy of the everyday that God becomes and is still our first priority. See, for the ritual law to take place, the people had to give offerings. These offerings needed to be stored, to be supervised, to be distributed to the priests. And that's what we see in this passage. Again, the structure for the obedience of the law. But here they are showing that we're going to put God first. And then everything else comes around that. We're going to, in our organisation... We're going to put the worship of God first and everything else is secondary. All right. 
Um, there is this experiment, if we go to the next slide, where you have, you have a jar, right? And you have big rocks, uh, medium-sized rocks, and, like, and little rocks and sand, yes? And the question is, how do you fill that jar so you can get all the rocks into the jar? Well, uh, the jar on my, uh, over here, they have put the, small, the sand in first, and then the little rocks, and then the medium rocks, and then the big rocks. And as you can see, the big rocks don't fit. In the other jar, what they have done is they put the big rocks in first, and then the medium rocks, and the small rocks, and the sand. And as a result, it all fits. The goal here, if we can go to the next slide, we need to put the big rocks in our jar first. Our jar is our life. Those rocks are our priorities. If we want to have God as the first thing in our life, if we want to organize our life around God, which is our goal as Christians, then what we need to do is we need to put the big rock of God first into our life. Everything else is secondary. Uh, what, how else we use our money, how else we use our time, everything else needs to be secondary, it needs to be smaller rocks, but often what we do is we put the sand of uh, secular concerns in our life first. And as a result, we have God sticking out the top because there's no room for him. God must come first. Um, I, there are some things my kids won't, do, won't be able to do because God comes first. There's some things that I am not able to do because God comes first. I was invited to a trivia night. Uh, I'm a big trivia fan, um, and a friend of mine invited me to a trivia night, um, and I'm like, yes, I'd love to go, and when is it? Oh, Friday night. Well, I can't do that, um, because God comes first. I I'm committed to youth group. Youth group, we're seeing really great things happen. I, I can't do that anymore. And I would love Friday nights off uh, again. I mean, I, I just probably use them where... Uh, Watch, use them watching Netflix. But in my 20s, I, I, I would have loved my Friday nights off. Um, but God comes first. When we put the big rock of God first priority in our life, then we organize the rest of our life around it. And then if something wants to come in that doesn't fit, well, sorry, God comes first. Whether that be in terms of your time, in terms of your money, in terms of your energy, God comes first. And then organizing the rest of our life around that. In this passage, we see the need for organization and the need for spiritual freedom in a church. We see the need for being active and engaged in our worship, uh, that we would sing so loudly that the neighbors start complaining. I mean, for that reason I can handle, for the re other reasons not so much, but that, that would be a good thing, right? Oh, you guys are singing too loudly to your God, yeah, my bad. <laughs> that would be all right. And, and finally, that God comes first in our life. That we put the big rock of God and everything else comes after that. Please let me pray. Dear Lord, um, thank you that, that we can find uh, things from you in all passages of Scripture. Because all is God-breathed. All is useful. And we pray, Lord, that you would challenge us with this stuff. That you help us find the tension and the balance of our church. That you help us to, to be engaged in our worship that you would help us to put you first. We thank you for this in your name. Amen.